I am um, thrilled to be here to talk to you. I know that you are uh, special students here who are uh, studying uh, various aspects of the Holocaust uh, with a curriculum that's uh, focused on the and Frank, who is uh, who's my hero too. Imagine if she were alive today. She'd probably be a great writer, well-known throughout the world. But her life was taken, as were a million and a half other children, Jewish children, who were exterminated uh, by the Nazis and uh, by their collaborators. And there were many collaborators, countries, people, good people, who were afraid to stand up. And um, I fortunately had some good people who were not afraid to stand up. And that's why I'm here talking to you. I was a victim at three years old. And uh, prior to that, we lived a normal life. We went on vacation. My two older brothers took me to the park. I was a kid, uh, a baby. My mother stayed at home. My father worked as a diamond dealer in Antwerp. I was born in Antwerp, Belgium, in 1936. And let me show you a couple of pictures of how we lived. This is a photograph. So this is a picture of my oldest brother, Sammy, he was 16 years old at the time. My mother, Nasha. My brother, Leo, he was eight years old. And this is me, I was only three years old. This was taken uh, in the summer of 1939, really uh, only a few months before World War II started when Germany invaded Poland. And we were at the beach along the English Channel. That's where we va vacationed in the summertime. And this is my dad, and my mom, again at the beach. Uh, my dad hardly had a bathing suit on because around the corner from where this picture was taken was a casino. <laughs> and my dad was a gambler. The next picture is uh, and here's a photograph of, uh, that's me, my dad. Look how well-dressed, and my mom, how well-dressed we all are. Um, I'm not too sure, but I'm guessing, and I may be guessing right, this photograph was taken in the fall of 1938, and you can see everybody is really all well-dressed here. And I think uh, we were either coming or going to the synagogue uh, to celebrate the Jewish New Year of uh, Rosh Hashanah. And uh, it was, uh, you know, a feast of celebration followed after 10 days of penitence, uh, Yom Kippur, which is a day of atonement where the Jewish people ask God uh, to forgive them for their sins. And also, if you, for, if you uh, sin against some person, you are supposed to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. So uh, if we are good and we do that, uh, God inscribes us in the Book of Life for the following year. The next picture is uh, one of my mom and me, and we took walks in the morning, got up early, went walking down the main avenue. This is the main avenue of Belgium, and uh, you could see again how nicely dressed I am. Uh, my mom said uh, to me often, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to dress you like a little prince. So I was her little prince. 
On May the 10th of 1940, Germany invaded Belgium, including my city, Antwerp, dropping bombs on the city. And we didn't go out to take a walk. Friday mornings, we would usually go to the Jewish bakery and we would buy challah, the braided bread that's used uh, during uh, the Jewish Sabbath, which is on a Friday night. The invasion took place Friday morning. So everything changed from that moment on. My life completely changed, children, completely changed. Affected me uh, tremendously in later years when I had difficulty you know, coping with life, coping with people. So here is my journey. Here I am in Antwerp, invaded May 10, 1940. We couldn't leave the house until three days later. I was only three years old at the time. Uh, we didn't have a car. Taxis were already busy transporting uh, people all over the place. And we had to wait three days until we got a taxi. And all we took was a couple of suitcases, left everything behind, the furniture, uh, the photographs, albums, everything, except for a couple of suitcases of clothes and blankets. Hopped into the taxi, drove us to the areas where we went on vacation. And it became a battlefield. The German planes were flying overhead. They were screaming down at treetop level, using their machine guns strafing us with their machine guns. People were dying on the road, refugees. By that time, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees on the road. You couldn't, you could hardly walk at a good pace. And there were cars on the road. And they were, were unable to go through traffic because we were so many, there were so many people that were blocking the cars and, the, and people on bicycles and, and, and horse wagons with their belongings. I mean, it was a mess. Uh, folks started just discarding their clothes on the road. It was bedlam. And the German planes came swooping down. And let me read to you a certain part. When we were eventually down, we crossed the Belgian border into France, and we were in this area right here, Calais. And when we were in Calais, we, according to what my brothers and my mother told me, I never was able to talk to my dad about our experiences because he had died before I really got interested in, uh, well, knowing just knowing what happened to me, but also knowing who I was. Who am I? This kid who in his teenage years and in his early 20s was afraid to talk to people, was afraid to go out with girls. Um, tough. So let me read to you a particular incident that happened in Calais. The planes were coming down. We scrambled into the fields and ditches. Mama dragged me out of the car, across the road, running every which way for a hiding place that wasn't there. Bodies were sprawled on the roads and in the fields, pools of blood around them. Homes were burning, collapsing. Not even the cows were spared as they lay dead in the field. Mama held my hand tightly in hers, afraid that the crowd would sweep me up 
and I would be lost forever, explained my mother. We were driving through Calais, and the planes were flying over us. And when the bombs were being dropped, we lay down on the ground. I threw you into a ditch and covered you with my body. So here I am, three years old, living in a world that wanted me dead. And it was like that throughout my journey, hiding, running, uh, staying in places that were not our homes, sleeping in barns, in a vacant castle, a little castle in France. And at one point, uh, being arrested and taken to a concentration camp in the southern part of France. So we go down here. We did have a car at one point that we purchased from a farmer, but it broke down soon after we left Calais and we went, uh, got into Abbeville, a French medieval city beautiful city with castles that go back to the Renaissance period. From Abbeville, we then were able to hitch a ride on a truck. And we were lucky to do that. And it was a couple of years ago I was on the internet and I was looking for pictures of what it felt like and what it looked like, people fleeing from, from the Nazis on the road. And I came across a photograph of a truck. And this is the truck. Wow. You know what's amazing about this picture? that I found? What do you think? My what? Yeah. My whole family. This is my mom. And here's my dad. Look at the way they're, they're dressed now. My mom looks like a beggar woman. That's my, back here is my brother Leo, hidden by this woman's raised hand. And over here is my brother Sammy. And that kid next to him, who do you think that is? Yeah. That's me. What a miracle, what a discovery. You know what that meant to me? It meant to me that I was really there, you know? I was a witness. And uh, it just overwhelmed me, this discovery. We'll go quickly through the close-ups and you'll see. Again, my mom and dad, my brother Leo, and my brother Sammy and me. A visual representation of what it felt like to run from the Nazis and the collaborators. You know what collaborators means? Anybody? People who helped out the Nazis. And among them uh, were the French, especially the French police, the French government, that finally surrendered to Germany in June of, 20, of, June of 1940, set up a new government that cooperated with the Nazis in eventually making life difficult for the Jewish people, in arresting them, and later deporting them to the extermination camps. So we were on the road traveling. From here, we went down, took a train to Paris, stayed in Paris only for a few days, heard that Belgium and Holland surrendered to the Germans 
and that the Germans were coming into France. And so we took a train all the way down to Bordeaux. And we stayed there for about three weeks until around the middle of uh, uh, June of 1940, or the third week in June of 1940. We heard that the Germans were coming into the area, and we took a taxi down to here, uh, near the Spanish border. And my brother tells me that when we did take the taxi, we were trying to cross into Spain. And the taxi driver said, you'll never be able to get through because the Germans were already guarding the border. Not the soldiers, but the Gestapo, the police, the German police, with the French border guards and the Spanish border guards. That kind of made it difficult for us to cross into Spain. But there were still many, many, many people who were able to cross into Spain. But uh, uh, we weren't. My mom was afraid when she heard that the Germans were at the border guard to take a chance of crossing into Spain and perhaps you know, being arrested by the Gestapo. Uh, the French uh, border guards, they were holding back young men like my brother Sammy uh, and forced them to join their army, which was already dilapidated because they lost to the Germans. I mean, it was a crazy world that we lived in. It was madness. There was no logic to what was going on. You understand? No logic. So we got into this area here, and there were thousands of refugees who were uh, you know, going along the same way. Um, we got into this town called Po, slept in a school gymnasium, uh, and one day uh, the French police come in and they order us out and they force us onto some school buses and uh, my brother Leo said, uh, they told us that they were going to take us to some nice places where we could rest up and be on our way. And we were taken to this place. It's an internment camp, in other words, a prison camp where thousands of Jews were held. My mom and I were separated from my two brothers and my father. Uh, the men lived in either this or that part of the camp, I don't know which, divided by an alley. And we lived in these little huts, crowded with people, women and children, sleeping on straw beds. Uh, couldn't get out at nighttime to pee. I remember I had to pee on my own little area and there was no else no place else to uh, to lay down because it was so overcrowded and I lay down on my own pee three and a half years old remember what you were doing when you were three and a half years old so here we are a camp called Gers G-U-R-S. The uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, refers to it as a concentration camp. It wasn't an extermination camp. It was kind of a holding camp. And it became a holding camp. Because in 1942, when the French government, with the cooperation of the Nazis, or turning around, the Nazis, with the cooperation of the French, began to round up Jews in 1942. In the summer of 1942, there were 4,000 Jews still in that camp in 1942. All of them were deported to the extermination camps, including Auschwitz, and only a handful returned, 1942. 
So, how come I'm here talking to you? A couple of weeks after we were in this uh, uh, camp, my brother Sammy escaped and uh, went to a nearby town, talked to a village mayor, told him what was going on, my brother Sammy, and the village mayor referred to him to a higher official, French official, to see in Po. So my brother hitchhiked to Po, went to the official's office and told him, look, my parents are in this camp, my brother is in this camp. We didn't do anything. So guess what happened? This French official, my brother Sammy said, took pity. And so he gave him some documents to take back to the camp to order the commander uh, at Gers to free the entire family. So we were freed. They transported us to a village on an army truck and dropped us off there nearby, not too far away from the camp. And we hid out in a uh, abandoned castle for a little bit. And then the village mayor came in one night and said we have to leave because the rumor was that the Germans were coming into the area. And so we took off in the middle of the night going through forest and eventually ended up at a rail station in Oloron Saint Marie. And from there, we took a train to Toulouse. And from Toulouse, we went to Marseille. And we stayed in Marseille for three months, so we were already into October of 1940. France had already surrendered. The Germans and the French were cooperating. In Marseille, we stayed in a little hotel for a few months until October of 40, when we heard that the new French government passed some laws against the Jewish people. Jews who were not citizens of France, they could be arrested uh, at any moment and taken back to camps like Gers. And there were uh, numerous camps around this area similar to Gers, which was the largest one of them all. So we became afraid what was going to happen to us. So we fled Marseille and we took a train to Nice in the French Riviera. I mean, it's, you know, the French Riviera is like uh, Miami Beach. Beautiful beaches, casinos. So here are some pictures of my brother and I at the hotel we stayed in. He's teaching me how to ride a bike. 1941. The next picture. Here I am with my bike and a friend of mine. His name is Mickey Abet. Lived with his mother in the hotel. He was my first best friend. And he was a Muslim. How about that, huh? Maybe if he and I got together now, we could make peace. <laughs> Next picture, 1941, my brother Leo and I walking along the promenade uh, adjacent to the beach. Look how skinny we are. The next photograph, my mom and dad. They look almost like skeletons. And the next picture of my brother Sammy told me his teeth were rotting at the time because of malnutrition. There was food rationing. We could hardly get anything to eat. I remember I was existing and just eating tangerines. 
dozens of tangerines a day. That was life. Always on the run. You know, this is an amazing story. But there was a woman, a Holocaust survivor, who was interviewed years ago by a reporter. And she said, told him the story. And the reporter said, oh, what an amazing story. And she said to him, amazing story. If you didn't have an amazing story to tell, you wouldn't be alive today. Understand? Understand. Okay, let's go on. So here we are in Nice, 1942. We stayed there from October of 1940 to August of 1942. That place was a safe haven for tens of thousands of Jews because that area right here wasn't controlled by the French nor by the Germans, but it was controlled by the Italians. And they were friendly to the Jewish people and protected us during that period as long as they could. But then in 1942, in the summer of 42, the French came storming in the police with the Nazis and began to round up Jews and just outnumbered the Italians. Early August of 42, the camp at Gers was emptied out. It came time to raid the town of Nice where we lived. Third week in August, the French police started to get together, break neighborhood by neighborhood, assign police to go after the Jews on this particular day, which was August the 26th of 1942. The day before, some guy comes running into the hotel where we stayed and he told my father that we needed to get out right away because the hotel was going to be raided the next morning, four or five o'clock in the morning. What could we do? My father was a gambler. And there was a beautiful casino in Nice. And he became friendly with an Italian Catholic man. And he called him up and asked him whether he could hide us out. He came over right away with his car. The afternoon before the raid. Picked us up. We left everything in the room. Took us to his home and he hit us out for about six, seven weeks. The only thing that we took was my bicycle. I wanted my bicycle. <laughs> so we stayed in the hotel in his place with his family. My brother Leo and I were living upstairs with the family. My mom and dad were hiding down in the basement. My brother Sammy, he had left earlier in April of 42 and escaped into Portugal. Uh, there were, uh, the French police in the spring of 1942 were picking up young men uh, and uh, to take them to the slave labor camps in Poland. And so my brother Sammy escaped from that. About six or seven weeks after that, I will have to tell you, I did go to school. 15? Thank you. 
I did go to school. The family that we lived with enrolled me in a Catholic school. And I remember that first day, sitting in the middle of the class, the teacher watching over me all the time, and, uh, and the kids around me. But I only went for one day. My mom, she became afraid. What would happen if somebody in the class would tell their parents that there is a Jewish kid enrolled in a Catholic school or in the school? So I didn't go. That was my first experience in education. And I didn't go back after that first day. Because my mom was afraid that perhaps the police would come into the classroom and take me away. So we left six weeks later. We're going into September of, uh, end of near the end of September of 42. And we took a train from Nice to Grenoble. And we stopped in Grenoble, uh, hiding in a Catholic convent. Uh, and the nuns, in the meantime, they made plans for us to escape into Switzerland. Um, when we took the train from Nice, I boarded the train, and a French policeman came to me, and he grabbed my bike away. Son of a gun. That was my prized possession, a new bike. The first two-wheeler. So we were hidden in this convent for a few days, and we were set to go from Grenoble to close to the Swiss border in the Geneva area. And we took the train. My mom and my dad were in one car, my brother Leo and I were in another car, accompanied uh, by another person, because we were afraid that perhaps, you know, either the French police or the, uh, the Gestapo would board the train and look for Jews who were trying to get away. So we stopped in a small French village along the French Alps. I and my brother got out first. Uh, the police, French police, were at the, at, at, at the uh, outside of the railroad station and asked the accomplice person who was ac accompanying us, what are you doing here? And he said, well, these are my children, and I'm going on vacation with them. And then came my mom and my dad, and uh, they looked at their false passports, and they said, all right, go ahead. And then all of a sudden, the two French policemen started running after us, and asked us whether we were related to these two other people. And uh, uh, my, the accomplice, who happened to be uh, a twin of my dad, my uncle. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I, I don't know these people. So they let us go, and they started running after my parents. And they were already somewhere in a bar, having a beer, seeing what was going on. And the people inside protected them. And the police couldn't find them, and they kind of shook their shoulders and went back to their station. So we walked up a long road at a, uh, stayed at a, a little hotel, had dinner there, and uh, my uncle had dinner with us. He left and wished us good luck. He was a French citizen, so he was still a little bit safe that we're not going yet after French citizens, but mainly after refugees, Jewish refugees. 
who uh, were not French citizens. So, middle of the night, a guy comes up and wakes us up. We were sleeping in a barn, and he was a guy who was going to help us cross into Switzerland. And he did. October 1, 1942, I crossed into Switzerland with my mom and dad and my brother Leo. Okay, this is my grandmother and my mom. She was a teenager at the time. When we got to the border in Switzerland, uh, the border guard said, I'm only gonna let people in who had relatives living in Switzerland. My grandmother lived in Switzerland. She was a widow and she met a guy in Germany where she lived with her daughter for a little bit who fell in love with this woman but didn't want to take her daughter with them. So her mother abandoned her and put her into an orphanage. You got it? And so when it came time for the border guard to ask the question, do you have any relatives living in Switzerland? My mom said, yeah, my mother lives in Switzerland. And so, you know, the border guards called up the police station in the town where my grandmother lived to confirm that my mom was telling me, telling the truth. And she did tell the truth. And so we were let go. Uh, we was, we were uh, placed in a refugee camp. We weren't yet free completely. Here is a document that shows uh, the names of refugees who fled into Switzerland. Everybody had records, you know, the Swiss, the Germans. Okay. So here is my name, Freddie, my brother Leon, my father Marcus, and my mom, Nasha Gross, among those who fled into Switzerland. I only got this last year when I visited the museum in Washington. Next, and here is uh, the refugee camp where my mom and I and my brother Leo stayed. We were only there for about three months. My mom was there for a year. Um, we were placed in foster homes, my brother Leo and I. Leo in one foster home, I was in another foster home. How long do I have? About five more minutes. Okay, good, good. So, I was then placed in a foster home where I had a tough time. The family that I lived with abused me. Uh, their son uh, sexually molested me. I had a tough time. So another aspect of not trusting people, being afraid of people. I was six years old then. Okay, we were, my parents were freed uh, a year, my father was in another displaced persons camp. And both my mom and dad were freed sometime around the fall of 1943. Here's a picture of me with my classmates in the town that I lived with my foster family. We got reunited in 1944, I did with my parents after they were released from the displaced persons camp. And of course, we lived with my grandmother, all of us. Next picture, here is my best friend in Zurich where I lived with my grandmother and my family, and that's me. Came over to this country in, in 1946. Here is the last picture taken with my grandmother. She didn't want to go with us. Leo, my dad, me, 
and my mom. Came here, came back to Antwerp. Okay? Tiffany, yeah. <laughs> here is a picture of me on the boat coming to America. How about that, huh? 1946. Went to school, went to college, got married, have four boys, Jonathan, Adam, Josh, and Mark. Also, grandchildren. Here are three of uh, Adam's daughters, Haley, she had a bat mitzvah in the uh, end of uh, 2013. And the next picture is of Joshua's two boys, Miles and Gabe. Next picture. These are shoes that were in the Holocaust Museum that were preserved by the Nazis as as evidence of what they were doing to the Jewish people. And this is just an example of one. And up here it reads, shoes, little shoes, big shoes. We are the shoes. We are the last witnesses. We are shoes from grandchildren and grandparents, from Prague, Paris, and Amsterdam. And because we are only made of fabric and leather and not of blood and flesh, each one of us avoided the hellfire. It was written by a Jewish poet. I have shoes too. These are my baby shoes. Okay? You want to see the real thing? to the train station, waiting for the train to take us to New York. I went to the bathroom at the train station, and I saw an elderly man, skin darker than I had ever seen before. And we walked out together, didn't say anything, and he gave me a smile. I walk out and I see two young white boys talking to my brother Leo who was on the bench. I had a feeling something was going on. And so I asked my brother Leo, listen carefully, 1946, it was the South. I asked my brother Leo, 
what's happening. And my brother told me that I walked into the long restroom. Can you tell me what kind of restroom I walked into? How about that? My first day on American soil, and I witnessed discrimination against a certain group of people. It made a tremendous impact on me. Especially when I was a reporter later on in New Haven, Connecticut. And I reported on the civil rights movement and on discrimination and persecution of African Americans. And I did a number of stories on that about, that was in 1966, I remember, I wrote some stories. 45 years later, I get a letter from one of the young black activists that I knew thanking me for what I did, for giving, for giving them voice through my reporting. Do you have any parting words for us? Parting words? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, I wouldn't be here today without the courage of people who helped us out. It took a lot of guts. It, 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 they risked their lives to save a Jewish family. And there may come a point in your life where you may have to stand up and be counted. Uh, a good friend of mine said, talking about bystanders, from a moral point of view, there may be no such thing as a bystander. If you are there watching people being bullied, uh, watching uh, injustices, being out of people. And if you are just standing there, you are taking part. You are just as guilty as the perpetrators. Remember that. Good lesson to learn. It was a good lesson. You know, I, I'm a learner. You know, I don't know everything. Right? I mean, I don't expect you, for example, to see a kid being beaten up by 20 people and then coming in and trying to rescue you. But call somebody. Call your teacher. Let them know what's going on. We won't forget, Mr. Brooks. <laughs>